Nas is regarded as one of the best rappers of all time for his work throughout the years. One such work is Illmatic, which is widely considered to be one of the greatest rap albums of all time. Though Illmatic was an instant success, it grew with popularity over time and Nas was hailed as a genius. But how does someone follow up one of the greatest rap albums of all time? The pressure was immense, especially with Nas having to deal with crossing over to make more radio friendly music while also still be appealing to the streets. This pressure would lead to Nas's most successful album to date, which is It Was Written. But before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys could be doing a million other things right now, but instead you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Also, follow my Instagram too, that would be greatly appreciated. You guys can always reach out and just show me some love, it's all good. Also, let me know where you're tuning in from as well, representing where you're from, especially if you're from Queens, but give me your top five favorite tracks from the album, Mine Are If I Wrote The World, The Message, Shootouts, Live Rap, Affirmative Action, and Street Dreams. Let me know what it was like when this album first dropped, because I always like those comments. But without further ado, I give you it was written the story behind the classic Illmatic would release in April of 1994, and though it's been labeled an instant classic, it wasn't an instant success, with it peaking at number 12 on the US Billboard 200 chart, selling 63,000 copies in its first week. Illmatic wouldn't reach gold status until January of 1996, which was almost two years later. It should also be mentioned that the album was heavily bootlegged, which massively affected the album album. MC Search, who Nas was formerly signed to, said that he was breaking into garages in the Bronx because counterfeiters had 70,000 cassettes of Illmatic with the drawing of Nas on a cross crucified. Despite the commercial performance of Illmatic, the critics and fans love the album, but at the end of the day, the music industry is driven by sales. The label has to make a return on their investment, and with Nas's sophomore album, we will see a shift musically. Nas wanted to make a street album with Marley Marl, who is a legendary hip-hop pioneer from Queens just like Nas. He loved what he did on LL Cool J's song, Mama Said Knock You Out, and Nas looked at him as an inventor of so many styles of hip-hop. This is the person who Nas really wanted his second album to be with. He began working with Marley, but Marley had lived kind of far away from Nas. Nas said that it always had felt like it was like a mission to get out there, even though they didn't work every day just on the weekends. He also didn't always get out there either because Nas was getting into trouble here and there. But after a while, some of Nas's songs appeared as promos on the radio with all kinds of people rapping on them. Meanwhile, he hadn't even finished working on the song for his album. There's a song called On The Real, which is a really dope Nas song that I hadn't like heard previous to doing this video, and it's one of my favorite songs by him. I love the beat by Marley, real classic stuff. But On The Real wouldn't be finished, and before it could be finished, it appeared on the radio with people rapping on it. This is something that Nas couldn't understand, and it hurt him because he knew that he couldn't work like that. This made him rethink the whole album. He didn't know what to do at that point because if he couldn't do it with Marley, he didn't have a plan B. This is when Steve Stout, who was Nas's manager at this time, comes into the picture of the story because they would have a meeting together. 1995 is when they started working together, which would be right after Illmatic. Previous to managing Nas, Steve Stout did not know him, and Steve would end up going to the projects in Queens looking for Nas, and when he started asking for where Nas was, Nas's brother Jungle pulled a gun out on him. They thought that Steve Stout was from another project because he was a big guy and pulled up in a Lexus. But this whole situation eventually ended up getting worked out. About Steve, Nas would say, Steve Stout had done little things here and there in the music business. He'd been working around, but no one knew him. When I started working with Steve, he managed producers. I saw him as fresh legs to run around this business with me. He wanted it more than anybody else and was smarter than everybody else. He knew what we wanted to do. He was custom auto. I was Mike Tyson. 
But after Illmatic, Nas began to start hearing his style in a lot of people, so he knew that he had to elevate his game, especially following the reception that he got from his debut album. There's a thing in the music industry that's referred to as a sophomore slump. By definition, a sophomore slump refers to an instance in which a second or sophomore effort fails to live up to the relatively high standards of the first effort. A lot of artists tend to do really well on their first album but when it comes down to following that up or rising to that occasion again, a lot of people tend to not deliver and in this case, they slump. Sometime in between Illmatic and It Was Written, Nas began to get lazy. Nas would say, Still, I guess I was lazy with it, and Steve Stout and Trackmasters didn't just let me put out anything. They cared, I didn't care. They were like, come on, the whole world is waiting for your next album more than they were waiting for the first album. Your first album came in and you charted low. It was good for a rap album with no big commercial records, but now the whole world is waiting for your second album. Take this stuff seriously. Notice how Nas mentioned the Trackmasters, who are a production duo who previous to working with Nas had worked with the likes of Mary J. Blige, Big Daddy Kane, Heavy D, etc. Steve Stout thought that the Trackmasters knew the sensibility for songs that were getting played on the radio but still had the credibility that a rap song needed. He felt like they could walk that fine line creatively. At this time, Steve Stout represented the Trackmasters, which Nas knew, and he trusted what Steve had been trying to do. Steve was young during this time period and full of ideas with him doing things like passing out notebooks with the launch date of the album since the album was called It Was Written. And another thing was Steve giving people fake NYC parking tickets. People would think that they got a parking ticket, but on the other side of the ticket, it would promote Nas's album. Another tactic would be that Steve would take some classic beats and put Nas's freestyles over them for a tape called Nas is Coming. Steve had inserted the tapes into a subscription of the Source magazine, so everyone who subscribed to it got the mixtape too. That's dealing with the marketing of the album, but as far as where the direction of the album was going musically, there were people who weren't necessarily pleased. Q-Tip, who had worked on Illmatic, said that Steve was killing Nas's career while he was mastering It Was Written. Steve Stout would say, I love Q-Tip. Here it goes though. When I was at the mastering session for If I Wrote The World, I'm a 25 year old guy making Nas's record and Q-Tip is telling me straight up, yo, you sure you wanna do this? Like questioning me. I'm looking at him and I'm like, is he mad that he didn't produce on It Was Written? Maybe it was that. Maybe he's right and it's not coming from any other spot. Then why are you putting Nas in a commercial place? I'm sitting there thinking, look man, it's Lauryn Hill in an homage to a hit by Curtis Blow. Like what is Q-Tip? talking about. The sound of it was written would be a lot different and on the production side of Illmatic, there were people like Q-Tip, Pete Rock, Large Professor, and DJ Premier. The only people to have appeared on both albums was L.E.S. and DJ Premier. But now with Nas's sophomore album said to be largely produced by the Trackmasters, Steve Stout would tell Nas that once he was in with the Trackmasters, they tend to produce the record. This didn't sit well with Nas because he was known as an underground rapper and the Trackmasters had some mainstream success. Ultimately, as we know, Nas ended up giving them a shot. As mentioned before, Nas was used to dealing with producers like Lars Professor, Q-Tip, DJ Premier, and they represented this raw hip hop. This is something that the Trackmasters have labeled good, but this music, as they say, doesn't have enough appeal to get the people in the stores to buy the record rather than your homie on the block. It's really crazy to see how different the times are because back then, if you were labeled a sellout, this could be negative to your career. A prime example of a person from back in the days who was labeled a sellout was MC Hammer. The man went diamond, dominated the radio and TV, had a TV show, and appeared in commercials along with a bunch of other things. He received a lot of criticism for these things because people felt like he was selling out. The people in Nas's camp wanted to avoid him being labeled a sellout because they didn't want him to lose his credibility. The track 
black masters were given the tough task of making stuff that could appeal to the radio while also appealing to the hood. In an interview, Steve Stout mentioned Biggie's song Juicy and how it repurposed the song Juicy Fruit. Steve said that it felt like almost nobody wanted Nas to do something like this and it bothered him. He felt like if the Illmatic formula didn't evolve, then Nas may have never reached his ultimate platform. Like, oh, he's not supposed to be successful? He's supposed to just be cool G rap? Like, G rap did something with rap lyrics that was dope and everybody appreciated what G rap did. Nas had the G rap thing, but Nas also is a superstar. G rap could write his butt off. He wasn't a superstar. Nas was a superstar. With it was written, we would also see a shift in the persona of Nas moving from Nasty Nas to Nas Escobar. This would be a shift to a more mafioso style with his rapping with Nas Escobar being in reference to the infamous drug lord Pablo Escobar. The first single for It Was Written would be If I Ruled The World, which would be released in June of 1996. This song would peak at number 53 on the Billboard Hot 100. A month later, It Was Written would be released and would sell 270,000 copies in its first week while peaking at number one on the Billboard 200. One of the last things I want to mention in this section is the album cover. On the cover of Illmatic, Nas was pictured to be a little boy. With It Was Written, Nas was to be older. Years later with the release of I Am, Nas was now a king and on top of the world. This will conclude this section of the video where I broke down the history behind the album leading up to it, but in the next section of this video, I will break down the history behind every song on the project. For the intro of the album, Nas wanted to portray this whole symbolism of being taken out of handcuffs and being set free. They would take the NWA approach with the interludes and sound effects and theatrics. After this, it cuts to Nas and AZ, and the year is now 1996, and Nas is 23 at the time. Some additional stuff about the intro is to talk about people being faker than the new, at the time, new $100 bills with the quote, big face on it. If you look at the newer model and the older model at the time, you can see the difference and the face was much bigger. The intro would finish with the lines, in the Quran it says Nas the men, Nisa's the woman, you know it was written. This would fade into the next track, which is the message. Nas felt like there were a lot of rappers in the game at the time making noise. You had artists like Jay-Z, Mob Deep, Raekwon, Tupac, etc. And everybody was gunning for a position. This is what Nas was getting at on the track of the message and telling everybody to back up. Tone from the track masters was at home watching the movie The Professional. And when the movie ended, the song Shape of My Heart by Sting came on and he jumped up and had an opinion. Tiffany. He would run to a record store, found out who made it, went home and chopped it up. He brought the beat to the studio one night at the end of a session. This record would also play a part in the situation between Nas and Jay-Z, which is a rabbit hole that I don't necessarily want to go like down in this video. This I do not want to go into that, but Nas was taking light jabs at people on the record and Jay-Z happens to be a person who people feel like Nas was taking shots at, but Nas has said that this isn't true. The line in question is Lex with TV sets the minimum ill sex adrenaline. About this line, Nas would say that he saw Jay-Z driving a Lexus with TVs in it. Nas had got rid of his Lexus at this point and was looking for the next big thing. Nas is adamant that this wasn't a shot at Jay-Z, but instead, it was just saying that that's the minimum that you gotta have. The song is a shot at everybody and not specifically one person and Jay-Z fell into this. People also feel like another direct shot on the track was targeted at Biggie because Nas said there's one life one love so there can only be one king. The reason why people feel like this was a shot at Biggie is because on the famous cover Biggie did for the Source magazine in 1995 they declared Biggie as the king of New York. The song is like the title says and is a message to the rap game at the time. People aspired to be the best and be competitive, but in New York at the time, there was also tension between people like Ghostface Killer, Raekwon, and Biggie. There's some more people as well, but you get the point. The next track would be Street Dreams, and Nas has said at this time, he still had one foot in the streets, so he was the voice for the people that he was hanging out with. He was talking about reality. He wasn't doing the songs and then going off to his mansion and never seeing anyone. His ride to the studio and back was 
still in drug dealer cars. Nas was still in a place where he didn't need to be and was still hanging out all over Queens, Brooklyn, Harlem, and parts of the Bronx. Nas had said that he was definitely the first guy from his era that was singing. He said that people wanted to hate until Biggie sang the song Play a Hater. Tone from the Trackmasters has said that if you look at original hip hop, like people from the Crash Crew, they were all singing. They were trying to incorporate that type of feeling on the record. This song also played a part in the beef between Nas and Tupac, which is another beef that I am not going to get into in this video. That is too big for this video. But the reason why there was tension between the two with this record specifically is because the song contained the same sample as Tupac's song, All Eyes on Me. All Eyes on Me would come out in February of 1996, while it was written was released in July of 1996. In an interview, Pope from the Trackmasters would say, at the time, Tupac had come out with the same sample. We had no idea he was doing that. So people ask, did Tupac take that idea from Nas or did Nas take that idea from Tupac? They were just being creative on the West Coast and we were being creative on the East Coast. It just so happened to play out like that. That was a total coincidence. But the song is about street dreams as the title of the song says. In interviews, Nas has talked about how drugs like crack really messed up the world and he wondered if people realized the damage that these drugs did to the community. People made a lot of money from it, but it was to the detriment of their own community and Nas wondered if it messed with these people's conscience. This fades into the next song, which is I Gave You Power, and this is one of my favorite Nas songs because I really like the concept behind it. The song's lyrics are a first person narrative from the perspective of a gun. The reason why this is so is because Nas was around a lot of guns around this time. Guns with him in his sleep, in his car, in his house, on his friends, etc. It was DJ Premier who produced this track and Steve Stout has said that his biggest job back then was trying to manage Nas and get him and DJ Premier back in the studio together. It was always a headache trying to get Nas and DJ Premier to get into the studio together because of their schedules or because DJ Premier would not like the sound. DJ Premier had been on tour with Gangstar and was just getting back and then he was going right back out to go to Japan. DJ Premier cites this as the reason why he didn't have any time to make any other beats for it was written. Nas told him that he wanted to make a record as if he was a gun, so they started messing around trying to figure out some things. The song was initially supposed to be a lot harder, but DJ Premier wanted the song to be more sad. In the intro of the song, there's actually a mistake with Nas stuttering, and this is something that Tone from the Trackmasters wanted to take out, but ultimately it was kept in. This song is also cited to be the inspiration for the Tupac song, Me and My Girlfriend, where Tupac compared his girlfriend to a gun. This bleeds into the next track, which is Watch Them, which features Foxy Brown. The inspiration for this song is that Nas was hanging with a lot of dangerous people at the time, and his brother Jungle told him, watch who was close to him. Nas had been pulled over and arrested around this time in his Lexus. He had no license and he had a gun on him, so Nas's brother was trying to give him advice, and Nas turned this advice into a song. By the time it was written came out, the Firm album was more than a year away from being released. Tone looked at this song as a way to, at the time, strengthen the relationship between Nas and Foxy. Why Foxy was brought in is because obviously she's a very dope female rapper, but with the vibe of the record, the Trackmasters thought that the song was too melodic. They felt like they needed to bring in some more harder elements to the song, so Foxy Brown was chosen because of her style. Simply getting Foxy into the studio was a challenge in itself, but when she finally did it, it was a rap. The sixth track on the album is Take It In Blood, and this track was produced by Live Squad, Low Ground, and Top General Sounds. If you're decently familiar with Tupac's story, then you probably heard the name of Stretch before. Nas said that he met Stretch of Live Squad via some dangerous cats that he was hanging out with. Stretch would become close to Nas immediately and they hung out all the time, pretty much every day. Stretch would actually drop off Nas at home and when Stretch went home, he would be killed. Since Stretch passed away, the Trackmasters didn't have the multi-track for the record. Stretch submitted the record and then passed away so they had to finish the record for him. 
due to them not having the multi-track, they were trying to finish it on cassette. The track masters put their own spin on it, but they tried not to take away any of the original elements that Stretch had already had on the record. The next record is Nas Is Coming, which is produced by Dr. Dre. During the making up, it was written, the East Coast West Coast feud was in full effect, but Dr. Dre would call Nas and say that he had a record for him. He would play the sample for the song over the phone and Dre wanted to show that a New York rapper could rap on a Dr. Dre beat and that it was all love. Nas would record the song at Dr. Dre's home studio. Nas is a big fan of Dr. Dre and when Illmatic came out, Dre came to a show that Nas did. Steve Stout thought that working with Dr. Dre was important for marketing the album because they were trying to do something special to reach a level higher than Illmatic. Steve Stout also said that Dr. Dre went on record saying that the best rapper that he thought in the game was Nas. This relationship with Dr. Dre was spent into the Trackmasters and Dr. Dre doing the firm's album. A good chunk of Nas's first verse of the song was meant for a song called Don't Stop Keep Going which was meant for a Dog Pound album but it said that Suge Knight would prevent this and Nas would be replaced with two Affirmative Action is the next song and something I completely had no clue about is that Nas always wanted to get his crew together around this time and had been calling it The Firm for a minute. The idea of a young 50 Cent and Mary J Blige being in the group was toyed around with but it didn't end up making the final cut of the group when The Firm released their debut album. Affirmative Action with 50 Cent came out on mixtapes before the song was officially released. AZ would do the intro on the track that was released on the album and AZ has said that he always tries to be the one on all the albums to introduce and set the stage. A good example of this would be Nas's song Life's a Beat on Illmatic. In the intro, AZ mentions the four devils which are lust, envy, hate, and jealousy which are things that he thinks that controls our society. AZ would also reference the movie Scarface in the intro with him asking if this is what it's all about which is said by Tony Montana during the famous restaurant scene when he's arguing with Elvira. So more about the record is that Foxy Brown was really feeling the heat because she had felt like the people that were featured on the song murdered it so she knew that she had to go above and beyond. I saw an interview where she said that she had somebody break down the drug game to her and in the last part of her verse she's rapping about drugs. She gets into this big math equation that doesn't add up and is something that she's gotten flack for throughout the years. After affirmative action comes the song The Setup which features Havoc of Mob Deep and is also produced by him. Nas was a fan of his work and really wanted to work with him by any means. Nas would work at a fast pace with Havoc because he was trying to get so much done with him but Havoc had his own projects to work on. Havoc did manage to produce and appear on two songs on the album but Nas wanted more. The song The Setup is about Nas's quest for revenge after his friend is murdered. In an interview, Nas has admitted that there's a mistake in the song that he didn't realize until the album was mastered. In this same interview, he said that he wouldn't put a spotlight on what the mistake was, but also noted that he was high and changed words around and said a word that didn't make sense. There's some speculation as to what this mistake is, but it's assumed that the mistake takes place in the second verse where Nas raps that the guy who killed his friend was in a Range Rover, but later on in the verse, he raps that the guy was in a Jeep. This leads us into the next track, which is Black Girl Lost, where Nas tells the story of a black girl who lost her way. A girl who used to be seen as pure and innocent, but now has turned into a life of drugs, alcohol, and sex. The song was inspired by a book with the same name of the song and has a very similar story to it as well. At the time of the making of this song, Nas had a lot of harder records, so now the people in his camp were trying to make records that could cross over and show a different side of Nas. Nas is a big fan of Jodeci and really loved JoJo's voice and is the reason that he put him on the song. He also liked KC's voice, but he thought that it would be overkill to have them both on the record. But this song ended up being leaked and something else that I did not know is that Nas has said that he has sequels to quite a few of his records. He was working on Black Girl Lost Part 2 when the song was leaked. He was working on the sequel to the song Shootouts and a couple of other records from the album too. His other sequels however never made an album. He never released them because they usually couldn't top the first one. If he could top the original then he put it out on the album. Black Girl Lost Part 2 would have originally been on the album but Nas never got back to fixing it. The 
the 11th track on It Was Written would be Suspect, and essentially it's a song about murder. This is one of them songs that you can make a whole video breaking down due to how much detail are in the rhymes and the amount of double and triple entendres Nas has in his verses. I feel like with any of Nas' songs, there's those who understand the song on a surface level and those who catch almost everything that he raps about. This song then bleeds into the next song, which is Shootouts and what the song is about is in its title. This was based off of true events, but Nas added some imagination with it being based on the life of him and his crew. The song Shootouts was originally put out as a freestyle with Nature and Nas on a DJ Clue mixtape, but it was so crazy that they thought that it should be on the album. However though, Nature wasn't on the version of the song that appeared on the album as because Nas really liked the beat and wanted to air out the song by himself. Tracks like this restored the feeling of the griminess that we saw on Illmatic. This griminess would continue on the song Live Rap, which featured Mob Deep. This song was originally supposed to appear on Mob Deep's album Hell on Earth, but Nas called them up when he was making it was written and asked if he could buy that song. Havoc was reluctant at first because he felt like the song was crazy hot and it was Mob Deep's Nas's feature, but they would end up selling it to Nas. They figured that the song would be bigger with Nas and figured that it it would be good promotion for them. Prodigy had this to say about the song. My rhyme on there is actually the rhyme that I originally had on LALA. I took the verse off of LALA because it was just too hot. I ended up just doing the chorus on LALA and Hav did his verse on there and that was it. I took that rhyme and put it on live rap like two days later. So I'm talking about California stuff. I said, got links like big cats down in Santa Barbara. The whole live rap verse, Nori tried to jack my stuff a little something. If you listen to it, you'll know what I'm talking about, but but it ain't nothing that's cool. LALA would be a component Noriega song that Mob Deep is featured on, but Nori refutes Prodigy's recollection of these events. Loud Records called us and said, you have to make sure that Prodigy verse doesn't exist. What happened was in between Pop Drop hit him up and said, Mob Deep, don't one of you guys got sickle cell. So even when he said that he was mad at Jay-Z for not representing New York, he's delusional. LALA wasn't him. That wasn't his idea. That was a component Noriega tragedy thing. Last but not least, we have the final song on the album, which is If I Ruled the World, which features Lauryn Hill. Growing up, Curtis Blow was Nas' favorite rapper, and Nas was also a big fan of the movie Crest Groove, which Curtis Blow appeared in. In the movie, Curtis Blow would perform his song If I Ruled the World, and Nas thought that that was a huge chorus. Nas has said that he didn't necessarily love R&B at the time, but when he saw Crest Groove, he loved what he was singing and rapping about. This was actually the first song that the Trackmasters would play for Nas. The Trackmasters have said that Nas was definitely hesitant at first about the song. They described Nas as pure hip hop and they were trying to cross him over, trying to give him a broader appeal in the marketplace. As noted, this is something that Nas got flack for because people were saying that they were trying to water him down. The strategy was not to give Nas harder records first so that they could ease him into the radio records. The plan was also to make sure that on the harder records, the hooks were sing along enough that they could cross over to the mainstream. Stream. But Nas's take on If I Wrote the World originally did not have a singer on it. The mission was to find someone that had hip hop credibility. The Fugees, once upon a time, were label mates with Nas and were also his friends. Nas would call up Lauren Hill, who is a member of the Fugees, and he wanted her to be a part of the song. A quick side note is that Nas was supposed to appear on Lauren Hill's classic album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, but he never made it to the sessions. This still remains one of the biggest regrets of Nas's career, but Tone from the Trackmasters at the time felt like the only other person who could have done the hook at the time was R. Kelly, but they ultimately went with Lauryn Hill and later worked with R. Kelly. But this record took a while to make, with Steve Stout saying that he mixed this song over 30 times because he wanted to make sure all of Lauryn's ad-libs were right. Nas has even said that they worked on If I Wrote the World for about two months. He would also end up doing a couple of his verses over because it just didn't work for the concept of the record. When the record was finished, the song was then white labeled and people didn't know why Nas had someone singing on the song. They didn't even know that it was Lauryn Hill because it was white labeled. When they finally officially released the record to the radio and let them know that it was Lauryn Hill, people now were starting to pay attention. This pretty much wraps up the story up it was written. In this video, we talked about the story behind the album being released and the story behind each song on the album. 
breaking down each song in its meaning while telling a story is an entirely different video, especially with the Nas album due to how detailed his albums are. I really felt like the story of It Was Written should be told because it is a classic album and has a great story behind it, just like Illmatic. All in all, let me know what you guys thought of the video. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.